Welcome, everyone. It's a wrap with Rap. I am your host, Ron Rappaport. I would like to thank all our listeners, our viewers, our supporters, and sponsors for making this podcast such a success. The podcast is being heard and seen in all 50 states, all provinces of Canada, and over 70 countries around the world. The podcast has been ranked by Feedspot as one of the top 35 overcoming adversity podcasts on the web. Please visit our website. It's a wrap with rap.com for all the episodes and previews of upcoming podcasts. This podcast features people who have overcome life's challenges and adversities, people who can inspire, motivate, and educate us on an assortment of topics. My guest today is Max Friedman. Max is an author, retired corporate communicator, memoir writer, and second generation Holocaust survivor. His book titled Painful Joy. A Holocaust family memoir is part memoir, part genealogical mystery, and part history, which explores the complicated relationship between two Holocaust survivors who experience the painful joy of a love touched by death. Max shares how his mother and father survived the horror of the Holocaust, spending several years being imprisoned in concentration camps. During that time, his father, his father's wife and two young daughters were murdered and his mother's husband, parents and most of her family were murdered as well. His parents met in Sweden after being liberated and fell in love, had two children and eventually migrated to America. Max will explain to us the difficulty living in a family where both parents were haunted by the war and the atrocities they experienced and somehow managed to survive. Max will share how he and his sister grew up in a dysfunctional household where each of the four family members struggled to deal with the past by creating their own fantasies. Welcome, Max, to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Well, we're glad to have you. I read the book. I found it very well written. Uh, I found it thoughtful and was very in, uh, a very insightful read into the long-term effects of the Holocaust exposing the harmful effects of the experience on extended families and the resilience of the survivors. Now, I'd like you to start out by telling us a little bit about your mother and father before 1939, when Poland was invaded. Sure. Uh, my parents uh, both came from Shtetl, small little villages uh, in Poland. Uh, they came from large families. My mother, at one point, her family numbered 13 children. Wow. Uh, and uh, about eight of them survived, uh, being uh, uh, a very difficult time for for poor Jews. And both of them came from poor Jewish families. Uh, my mother's uh, father was a tailor. My father's father uh, was... A merchant, uh, really just sort of working in the shtetl, uh, selling farmers uh, kitchen utensils and other and other equipment, um, and they lived a, a decent life for what it was, filled with anti-Semitism, uh, but that was true for most of uh, of Poland's Jews. Poland actually had more Jews living there than uh, any other country except for the United States, and uh, depending on how you counted Jews, Russia. Um, so they survived a lot. Uh, and uh, my, my mother was a refugee from the First World War. Uh, my father's father died when he was very young, and uh, he became the breadwinner in the family. So it was a tough life. Uh, but uh, by 1939, my mother had gotten married uh, to a luggage maker and my father and lived in Krakow. And my father had married actually a wealthy Jewish woman whose uh, parents and grandparents owned a number of shops in a, in a small town. And he had a wife and he had one child before the war and another child actually during the war. Wow, okay. Now, uh, first off, Max, what inspired you to write the book? Well, I, I spend most of my life avoiding uh, writing uh, anything about 
uh, my past and my parents' past because I, uh, I was living it. And uh, that seemed to be more than enough. I gave it the office. And so uh, I decided that I would rather not know more. And I, and I understood from a very early age how painful it was for my parents to talk about uh, their past. Sure. And then my sister, who was a little older than me, and I spent a, a good part of our young lives uh, trying to help them avoid the past. And so I naturally fell into that world as well and uh, knew my life wasn't normal and wanted to try to normalize it as best I could. Uh, but that didn't work out quite so well. So you normalized it by kind of avoiding the subject. Yeah, yeah, we avoided the subject. My mother uh, did spend a lot of time telling us about one aspect of her early life, which was, which was the time she spent in the concentration camps. So uh, I hate to say it, but I probably knew the words Mengele. I, I knew the words Plaschow and Auschwitz probably before I could even say my own name. Uh, my mother talked about them endlessly, but I didn't know anything else about her life. Uh, I didn't even understand why she talked so much, except that I think uh, she had to in some way. My father never spoke about anything in his past until I was 20 years old. Max, didn't your grandson have something to do with you writing this book? Didn't he yeah. ask you a question or something? Yeah, eventually... Uh, uh, my grandson, uh, we, we, we were very close to him. And when he was about eight years old, he was, he was having troubles in his life. He, he was concerned about lots of things. And I, and I was trying to sort of make him feel that, you know, things could be difficult even at a young age, but you get over it. And, and I, and I started to talk about the idea of survivors, uh, and just, casually would talk about how my mother and my father lived through some very hard times and we did with them and they were survivors and I was called as a second generation survivor and he was only eight at the time but then he asked me about surviving and he said so uh, what does that mean does that mean that you were strong and that they were strong and will I uh get some of that myself. Did you give some of that to my father, to my son, his right, father? Right. Uh, and then will I be able to be strong like a survivor as well? And I said, well, uh, I really don't know because I don't really know much about my past. And that got me started. I had I had written or ghostwritten two memoirs for for other people. And I knew more about their lives, uh, clearly, than I knew about my own, and I was embarrassed. And it was 2016, and that began my journey to find out who they were and, in a sense, who I was. So your grandson uh, played a significant role. Oh, yeah, in you yeah, yeah. And, and when uh, when I wrote the draft of, of the book, uh, I I showed it to my my wife, who, who was following with me and, and was researching with me uh, to my two sons and uh, to my sister and to Jacob. And they got the first manuscript and I wanted them to see it and let me know what they thought. Yeah. Had, had he never asked you that question, who knows? We might not even be talking right now. We might not. And uh, I might still be wandering around <laughs> in my <laughs> craziness. Now, Max, tell us about the research to, uh, you did to find out all the information uh, that you wrote about, and did you receive any help doing it? I understand the research took you about five years. Is that correct? Yeah, it, it took five years. It, it was very difficult because, obviously, uh, a lot of the information was destroyed as uh, the records were destroyed. Uh, uh, young Jews in Poland... Uh, there were very few civil records, uh, and most things were kept in synagogues. And those kind of synagogues were were, were burnt and, or, and destroyed, and the records were taken. And so it was very difficult to begin. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have mentioned it to a friend of mine, 
that I was thinking about doing this. And uh, and he said, you know, I had just come back from a, a, a high school reunion and and uh, I saw a friend who I hadn't seen for years. And he said that his his son was working at a Holocaust study center in Germany. And maybe he could advise you. And I got in touch with him, this lovely man, and uh, not Jewish, uh, Austrian actually, and had devoted his life to learning about the Holocaust, studying it, uh, being an academic. And, uh, and so he gave me a great many leads. And I followed those leads and I followed the breadcrumbs that were left in lots of different places. And uh, I learned a lot. Uh, I, I, I made a list one day of uh, how many things surprised me. And there were over 50 very significant things that I that sort of left me breathless. Wow. And, 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 it, and it took five years to get through that, visiting Poland, visiting Israel, visiting Germany, uh, visiting Sweden, where we were born. Uh, and, uh, and I learned a lot. I met uh, a few people who, uh, who actually, one person who actually knew my, my mother and father and us in Sweden. We, we didn't know her until we found her. Uh, and I met a niece of my father's from his first marriage in Israel who was actually uh, working as an historian at Yad Vashem. So uh, things came together and, uh, and there were extraordinarily many emotional moments as, as I sort of followed their footsteps in their lives. What, what stands out? You said you were surprised. Uh, there were like 50 things on the list. Well, but I was surprised. What stands out the most? Well, I, I was surprised by the story, the 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 information that I finally got from them, or uh, my my mother and father. As I said, my father only spoke to me about his past for twenty minutes, and he told me the story of the last time he saw his uh, wife and children. Yeah, uh, and and it was it was a, a very sad story, and 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 it's in in the book, and. And I, what I discovered was that it wasn't quite true. My mother had told us for years that she had married a dance instructor uh, who had this, this wonderful and very prosperous dance studio in Krakow. And she worked for him and they, they made thousands of dollars and all of this. And and then when after she met my father, she was disappointed that, you know, he he really no, we never made he, we were poor and and she had left this wonderful life. And unfortunately, a life that that was changed forever because of uh, the Holocaust. Uh, and it turned out that virtually nothing that she told us was true. Uh, so those were two sort of remarkable experiences and more remarkable was me coming to understand uh, why they told us those stories and why that helped them su survive, I think. Sure. What what roadblocks did you encounter doing the research? Well, uh, sometimes you, you still sort of felt that anti-Semitism hadn't really left <laughs> Poland right. all that much. Uh, we We would go to some uh, archives, and we were treated quite quite nicely. We would go to others, and and we were treated poorly. Is a nice way of putting it. Okay, disrespectfully. Uh, uh, they knew fairly quickly we were Jews because we we we. One of the people that helped us was. Uh, a guy who worked in the in uh, in Warsaw for a Jewish historical institute, but he spoke Polish. He he had moved from Israel to Warsaw, and so he was our interpreter. And uh, so it, it it was clear that we were Jewish. Uh, the questions that we asked, and uh, sometimes that 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 was not helpful. Uh, but uh, but 
but we managed to find an awful lot and uh and it felt good to really begin to understand who my parents were and really the kinds of things that that they went through before the holocaust and during those years well that that leads up to my next question i wanted you to tell us uh the experiences your mother and father endured from 39 to 45 as captives uh starting with your mother first and you know i don't want to set off any triggers or anything like that but you know whatever you want to tell us just go ahead and you feel comfortable sure my mother the the interesting thing about my mother's story is that uh for those people who who are listening or watching uh who saw who have seen schindler's list yeah steven spielberg uh in fact one of the surprising things about uh that is that uh spielberg shot the krakow ghetto scenes in the tenement that my mother lived in for 25 years wow. and i only i only discovered that discovered that when uh, i was googling the address because we were going to go visit every address that i could find for my parents uh, when they were younger and and and, and in google the, i put Joseph at 12 in Krakow and I and I get this long thing about Steven Spielberg and and so it, it turned out that he she lived in Krakow for 25 years with her husband who as I said was not a dance studio uh uh entrepreneur but but in fact made luggage in a luggage store uh and she uh, survived the Krakow ghetto. Uh, she then survived uh, Plaschow, where, uh, again, if people watched Schindler's List, you would see uh, Ralph Fiennes uh, played Amon Get, and Amon Get was called the, the butcher of Plaschow. And he, he was the guy, and my mother would tell us these stories, he was the guy who would, at breakfast, uh, randomly shoot people, uh, inmates who were just walking the yard, uh, and and my mother would tell us these stories, and we didn't believe anything until we saw Schindler's List. Yeah. And suddenly, her story was Schindler's List without being a Schindler Jew, which meant that she wasn't saved. So she went through the Krakow Plaza, the Krakow ghetto, uh, and then Auschwitz. And uh, after Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen, and that's where she ended the war in Bergen-Belsen. And uh, she managed to save her sister. Uh, she was uh, in the selection at Auschwitz. Uh, her sister was older and I think heavier. Uh, and uh, she saw her being taken to one side and she was taken to the other side. And the side where my mother's uh, sister was taken to had old people and children and they were going to the to the gas chambers yeah. and and she knew something was wrong she was very intuitive if crazy and she uh she pulled her across uh bravely uh doing that as they set the guard the dogs on them um and uh that woman my aunt stayed with her uh, their entire lives uh, she just saved her life saved her life yes wow. and they had a difficult relationship even then but she did and she uh so so auschwitz was was horrific my mother was in bergen bells and actually when anne frank and her sister were there and they all suffered from typhus and my uh and anne frank and her sister actually died from typhus uh they were and then she was liberated and uh she was taken by the swedes the swedish red cross to sweden to recuperate uh she was terribly malnourished uh and psychologically she was destroyed uh that was my mother yeah uh, and she had uh five brothers and uh and they, they and all their families were were transported out and and killed. Uh, her husband was killed in Buchenwald. 
my my aunt, uh, her daughter and husband were murdered as well. So uh, it was, uh, she had no one. She yeah. had no one at all. My father met her in Sweden. Uh, he had uh, started very early uh, in slave labor camps. So he was in three slave labor camps before being sent to concentration camps. And he spent almost the entire war in one camp or another. So amazingly, he survived five of these camps. Uh, and he uh, survived a death march from the camp that he was in in, in, uh, in Germany. And he ended up in Bergen-Belsen as well. And he ended up taken by the Swedish Red Cross to Sweden also to recuperate. And they met at one of the camps that were set up by the Swedes for these refugees. And uh, the, be the best thing about the book to me and finding things out was that, uh, that they loved each other because in fact, for most of their life, they just fought and screamed I think screamed at the world uh, and screamed at each other because that these are the only people that they had. Yeah. Uh, but but I found love letters uh, that my father had written about meeting this woman and uh, who became my mother. And uh, so that 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 brought me joy as yeah. well, because to see that that they could survive and that's where painful joy, the the. The title of the book came from because uh, I had I had read that there was a, a poet in the Middle Ages who had written a poem about what happens to love when it's touched by death. And as soon as I saw that, and I saw the title of the poem, I said that has to be the title of my sure. book. Sure. Now, uh, I don't know. Do you have a copy of the book there by chance? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do have it. Because I noticed on the cover, there's a picture of your parents. Okay, I'm, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, I noticed on the cover, if you want to show people yeah. the cover. Yeah, there's a picture of your parents on a motorcycle. Can you imagine that? <laughs> so so tell, do you know anything about that? Was that their motorcycle? Well, I, 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 honestly, I think it was staged. But it, it was, I, I mean, staged by them <laughs> in Halmstadt, which is where I was born and where they met, uh, uh, I mean, or where they lived and, and where my sister and I were born. Uh, but this was, this was a picture that was taken just six months after they had been liberated from Bergen-Belsen. And it was six months before they were married. So they were still courting. And this was the best clothes that they had. Actually, this is my father's only suit. It was given to him by the Swedish Red Cross. And and in whatever pictures I have from Sweden, he's wearing that suit, except uh, for when he was working in a shoe factory. And uh, so... So th this was a wonderful picture to have discovered because it it it, it again showed me uh, what they wanted to become yeah. in a sense, and and you know th this was not their world, motorcycles or even being dressed up or or any or being in Sweden for that matter, but but it it showed me that that they were trying so hard sure. to start again. Uh, and I didn't. I didn't mention my. But my father did have these two little girls, and and the story that he told me about uh, the last time he saw his wife and two little girls, and he told me that when he uh, he didn't know what happened to them, that they were hiding out, and uh, then they were discovered, and they were taken away, and on the death march to Bergen Belsen. He meets somebody from his hometown who tells him that he saw my father's wife and two children at Auschwitz at the ramp, train ramp. And the children had been taken away from, from their mother. And the mother, he said, ran over 
and said, I go wherever they go. And so that's when my father discovered uh, that they had been uh, actually murdered. Wow. And, yeah. uh, and, and when I even found out the names of these two little girls, Ada and Feigla, uh, suddenly they became real. Sure. And that's, that, that got me to thinking about the book more seriously in that, that this is a story about two real people who, who had a life before, who had families before, and then had nothing. And when you meet them, you meet them as sort of a nameless, faceless people, another, another survivor, um, one of not the six million who died, but, but the few hundred thousand who didn't. And uh, then uh, you get to know them. And yeah. that's that became the the point of the book is painful joy was about meeting these people and feeling something for them. Uh, and that I thought would be a way of restoring their humanity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to move on. Your family em uh, my emigrates to the US in 1952. Now, how did that come about? And what was the tra that transition like for them and you and your sister? Yeah, well, my father wanted to go to the U.S. Uh, as, as soon as he, as he got out of Bergen-Belsen. He had some first cousins who had left Poland in the 1920s and moved to the United States uh, because there were pogroms going on in Poland in the 20s, and they had had enough. And so they left. And so he had been communicating with them from Sweden to see if uh, there was a way for them to bring us over. Uh, America was not interested in taking, taking any of the refugees from the camps for the first few years after the war. So nobody got, nobody from the camps got to the United States. Uh, they first opened up and changed the quota system a bit in 1948, and my father tried, uh, but he couldn't. Uh, he couldn't get an appointment at the consulate and whatever. And so it took uh, seven years to get to the United States, and we had uh, we were brought over by a refugee agency uh, on a Swedish ocean liner in a January, and. Uh, and they found us a place to live in Coney Island. And that's where we grew up. All right. Now, you are now in America growing up. What was uh, you and your sister, Rachel, uh, lives like under the parenting of your mother and father, uh, who obviously suffered long-term effects? I guess they call it survivor of concentration camp syndrome uh, from their war years of, of survivorship. In other words, tell us about the family dynamics growing up. Yeah. What were the family dynamics like? Yeah. We lived in Coney Island, which as as some of your your listeners and viewers would know, uh, was a big amusement park area. Yeah. Uh, right well, by the ocean, right? Yeah, we, we lived right by the ocean. We lived in this tiny two-room apartment uh, looking out at an, a lovely alley. But... Uh, <laughs> the, uh, we were not allowed to go on any rides. Uh, my parents were afraid, afraid of everything and of everyone. Suspicious. My mother was paranoid, if you could, perhaps with good reason, but paranoid yeah. nevertheless. I mean, they have good reason to be. Right. But, but so we were, and they were very afraid of losing us or us being hurt or anything like that. So it, it, it was a tough time because we couldn't go on anything. We, we would sit, uh, we didn't want to be in our apartment in particular. Uh, my father sent us to yeshiva. Uh, it was the, probably the poorest and worst yeshiva that, that one could imagine. Uh, uh, and I, I finally told my father that the that the rabbi had hit me uh, when I was in fifth grade there, uh, which wasn't true, but I told him that, and and he immediately took us out of yeshiva and went into public school. But the 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 the, the sad part was that uh, they had nightmares. They had, they suffered from PTSD, 
as you would call it now. Yeah. Uh, so we would be waking them up a lot. We would try to uh, have them avoid learning anything more about concentration camps or about wartime things. Uh, my mother tried to sort of live her life through my sister, which was not a good thing. And she tried, she made up this story about what her life was like. And she wanted my sister to be like she would have become. And that, that was very trying for my sister. Uh, I just wanted to disappear. Uh, when I was uh, seven years old, I started taking the subway uh, into Manhattan. And I would dress up as though I were an adult, if one could believe that, because I was a shrimp. Uh, <laughs> not that I'm any much taller now. Uh, but uh, but I, I, I had a fantasy life of my own. I, I would carry a manila envelope because that was the closest I could get to a briefcase. I would put on a little bow tie. And I, my father would be sleeping because it was the Sabbath. And so we would go to synagogue in the morning and then he went to sleep. And my sister and my mother would go out and I would take the subway. And I would go into the city and I would ride up and down elevators as though I were an adult uh, living a life of an office worker. Um, so it was it was very strange, very, very strange. And uh, the and. But they, they were sad people. I, I would go with them sometimes to the United Restitution, which was the, the people who would give reparations. And then you'd have to show up once a year. I mean, the reparations were $45 a month uh, wow. for each of them Not much. When, when we first started. And then the mark got better, so they got more money, but they didn't actually get more money. They just, uh, the, it came up in value. Uh just to see if they were alive. So I would sometimes uh, translate for them and they would tell me in Yiddish what they wanted to say and I would tell them in English. I, I understood Yiddish, but I was so not wanting to be in their lives at a certain level. I refused to learn to speak Yiddish. I would only, I would understand it uh, and I would only speak to them in English. Uh, but it, it was... It was, you know, I mean, a life where you, you the kids become somebody call uh, people like us child parents, because yeah. we were we were taking care of them as much or more than they were taking care of us. So there uh, was some. You, you, would it be fair to say there was some you being ashamed of them a little bit? I I was yeah I I was not happy to be known as a Jew. <laughs> So when the Italian kids and the, and the Avenue X boys went after us, it was not a... a so, uh, yeah, I, I, I tried to hide that. Uh, um, I, I, I didn't invite our friends over to our apartment because it was sort of a shabby place. Uh, we had old furniture. Uh, uh, over time, I grew up. And I matured, and and I just felt that uh, I I became to understand certainly, mm, right, what happened to them, and right, how that affected them. And they were and doing then, the and they were doing the best they could. Oh with, yeah, always with what they had. But yeah, you know, I mean, when we, you're young we, like that, you... yeah, we we never expected. And and my sister was is and was wonderful with them, uh, and 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 we we just said it's easier to do whatever they wanted than to argue with them. So we just did whatever they wanted. I mean, you know, I when, even in uh, when I when I went to college, I would come home on the weekends and uh, I would go to synagogue with my father because he that was the only time where he seemed to be relaxed and and happy. And so, you know, no, no big deal. So you knew your home life was was not normal compared to your friends. Did Max? Did you confide in any but anyone about your situation? And was counseling offered to your family at all? Uh, no, they never. No, no, <laughs> they never. They never got any help for 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 their mental uh, problems. They they uh, and for me, uh, 
I I didn't really think of myself as a survivor until I actually I was I was working and and I was went to some management retreat and there were industrial psychiatrists who were there. We were supposed to bring with us a problem from our workplace. And the problem I had was my boss, who was a bully. And and uh, in these days would have been fired, but back then not, because he was a good worker. Uh, and and I had described him at, at this session. And I had told the psychiatrist a little bit about myself. And he was the first one to sort of say, well, you, you know, your parents were survivors and you, you've spent a good part of your life trying to survive. And here you are still trying to survive a bully of some sort instead of leaving. Uh, he said, your, your parents couldn't leave, uh, but you can. And so I would urge you to quit and, and go somewhere else where they appreciate you. And in fact, as a survivor, I didn't leave. I had two kids. I had a job that paid well. And I just said, I said, I'm going to stick with it. And uh, it was not probably the best decision I ever made. But it was, it was one that I think would be typical of a survivor. Yeah, for sure. Uh, tell us about your parents' uh, later years and about you and your sister's lives as you approached uh, adulthood and beyond. Yeah, so my parents, uh, my father worked till he was 65. Uh, my my mother was a homemaker. She never worked. Uh, they, they lived a, a quiet life, except uh, they argued with each other constantly, mostly about money. Um, and the fact that my father was not ambitious and which which really to me was just that he he was so he so much wanted I think he spent a good part of his young life taking risks, particularly in the camps, taking great risks to survive. And he wanted to take no more risks with himself or with his children. And so he was not ambitious. He was happy to whatever job he had, and he had the same job from the time that we came to the United States till the time he retired. And my mother always was very, very difficult about all that. Uh, in any case, ultimately, my father had Alzheimer's disease. And, uh, and so he and my mother moved down to my sister, who had left New York and married and had children and lived in Mobile, Alabama, of all places. And my parents moved to Mobile, Alabama, of all places. That must have been a quite a, yeah. a culture and, shock coming yeah. from New York. Right. And so what my mother did was uh, the survivor that she, she remained, she became the celebrity Holocaust survivor in Mobile, Alabama. And so every year they, they, had, they lived there for, I guess, uh, seven years. Uh, the last seven years of their lives. And so uh, every year, they some radio or television station would call them up and say, it's a Holocaust Remembrance Day. Tell us. And she would be delighted to go over Mengele and Auschwitz and everything else. And we have, we have clips from newspapers of all that. And actually, I, I was down in Mobile talking to a group of... Uh, of uh, college students uh, about my parents uh, just a month ago, uh, talking about the Holocaust, and and and, and it was a, a wonderful experience actually, to uh, because yeah. uh, very few people who were Jewish, but people who were interested and kids who were interested, which I found even better. So you're doing some, uh, you're out there doing some advocacy work yeah, beyond I, the book. I, I, I'm trying. I'm I'm trying to 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 again continue to uh to find a way f to get people to empathize with with people who they may not have ever known or or would never have known uh right. particularly these days where everything is so fraught did you eventually figure out how to answer your grandson's question about survivorship 
Yeah, I said that. <laughs> I, I, and and he came with us actually to Israel and to Yad Vashem and and all of that. And uh, and and I and I I was able to tell him how surviving is not easy and it's not always the it's it's the only thing you have and you do the best you can and if you keep yourself strong and keep thinking about today and not that much about tomorrow i think you you have a chance and you don't look back and you don't look forward i i think it, for anybody who who were in my parents' shoes, and I don't think I would have been able to have survived what they did. Uh, I think you 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 have to live in the moment, and and do what you can. And and I I was proud of my father because I met a man who was in the camps with my father, and the only thing he would ever say to me, and he he was living in Venezuela, and he would visit my father every few years, with his family, and he said. This man saved my life many times. He never told me how. And I asked his daughter, who I found uh, in researching the book, and she said he never talked about it except to tell me that your father saved his life many times. And that 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 was a wonderful yeah, thing the major to leave. Good. And that was a legacy that uh, I'll hold dear all the time. Sure. Max, uh, how did you feel when the book was finally published? And after learning so much, after writing this memoir, what stands out the most? Well, I mean, the the, the sad part is that uh, I never asked them all the questions I asked everybody else. So uh, I don't know what they would have told me uh, if I really delved and had like a real sort of sit sit down interview yeah. with them, which is what I would do with for the rest of my life and in my in my professional life uh but uh i i i just felt that i was giving them something that i couldn't give them uh in when they were alive i i could help people honor them help people look at them as not some poor misbegotten uh, sad people, which they also were, but actually as heroes, as people who who stood not up against the Nazis, but 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 managed to survive whatever came to them, and and they started again, and to be able to start again and to have children and grandchildren and uh, and a life. Uh, uh, even with all the memories, and and I saw how they had to tell stories to themselves that maybe were not true or not quite accurate, but they had to do that because the memories that they had were not memories that they wanted to keep. So they had to create new memories for themselves that they could hold on to that would not necessarily give them a nightmare. Sure. And uh, one of the big themes of of, of the podcast uh, is we don't ever want our our people going through adversities to to quit, and they never quit. No, they kept no. Going. They, the quitting was not an option for them. No, no. And I'm I, sure it could have it would it would have been much easier to quit. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the 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 you know, when when I when I talk about it. Uh, and people ask me, so what did you learn in your life? And I learned to never give up. Right. No, no matter what. I mean, on the smallest things, I'm I'm quite annoying, I think. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and a pain. Uh, but but I, I just I persevere. And 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 I learned that persevering, you know, can be hard, it can be painful, actually. Uh but but it's the it it can also make you feel that you've done everything you could, and and there aren't regrets, uh, and I think that's that's important as you get older. Now there are uh, there are people out there, uh, there are Holocaust deniers out there, and there's people out there that are not educated on this subject. Uh, what are your thoughts about that to improve that situation? 
Yeah. I mean, the Holocaust survival, the Nyer stuff and the anti-Semitism that we see is just, I mean, it's, it's uh, disgusting, nauseating, uh, ludicrous. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to imagine. But people are not educated. I mean, I think it is certainly true that there are some states in the United States where Holocaust curricula are, in fact, required. But there are also places when where it's not. In Europe, the same is true. Uh, my my book is published uh, by a, a Dutch publisher, uh, Amsterdam Publishers, and in in Holland, uh, where more Jews, I mean, in terms of percentages, were actually killed, murdered, than in most of the other countries as a proportion of population and of, of the Jewish population. Uh, the, the surveys show that uh, that ho ho uh, Holocaust denial is 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 quite common, and Holocaust ignorance is even more common. And I think we, the 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 joy I got when I got to Mobile was actually talking to to uh, students who were interested in the Holocaust, who were doing projects about the Holocaust. They were not Jewish; none of them was Jewish, but. But they had heard about it, and they wanted to know what the truth was. And I think truth is now uh, something that we don't we we say. Well, there's there are many truths. Well, there are not many truths. <laughs> there is a truth, and then there's there's everything else. Right. And and uh, if we don't start telling ourselves the truth or hearing the truth, uh, we'll be we'll someday be in a similar situation and and we just won't even know how to navigate through that um, my my parents when they were younger when when the nazis came to their doors they they didn't know what to expect they did they didn't imagine that this would ever happen even with years of anti-semitism behind them so here we are uh, a nation a well-educated nation in theory that where uh, kids don't know much of anything about any of this. And these books, I think, are still important. And it's up to the second generation, people like me and my sister, to to carry the story forward uh, because the, the, the survivors themselves are pretty much all gone. Sure. Uh, how can people contact you, Max? And where can they find the book Painful Joy? Sure. Uh, Amazon, where you can find everything else right. uh, in life. Uh, uh, but Amazon is the easiest. Uh, there are some libraries that, that now have it, uh, Barnes and Noble. And they're there. Uh, so you, you can get it that way. You can uh, go to my website. I actually created a website called maxfriedman.net. A catchy title, I'm sure. But uh, <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, uh, www.maxfriedmanoneword.net. Okay. And 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 you can find more sources for where the book is, and you can find more information about the book, including excerpts. Max, you lived and survived through a lot. What words of advice do you have for people out there to overcome their adversities, whatever they might be, and live a happy life? I think I think what I uh, I would reiterate the idea of first of course never giving up never saying that that this is too much uh there there is always some hope somewhere you just have to find it and you have to keep that close to you uh you have to give make your make a life for yourself it's no one's going to do it for you uh and I think that's what the survivors learned, that that they had to live in the moment, not look back, and look ahead because you're creating the, your own future. Uh, and when, when I sign the book, I always sign, never give in, never forget, and never, ever give up. Awesome. Awesome. I want to thank you, Max, for coming on the podcast and sharing your story. Uh, I highly recommend people out there to read the book, educate yourself on the topic so the world will never uh, experience something like this again. 
And once again, Max, uh, thank you for making yourself vulnerable. Thank you for coming on the podcast and sharing your time with us. Great. I appreciate it very much. And if you go to that website, you can actually send me notes and I'm happy to respond. Will do. And I will put uh, all that information will be in the podcast notes. Uh, comments and suggestions for the podcast, you can e email me at it's a wrap with wrap gmail.com. Our Facebook group, uh, which is growing, uh, it's in the thousands. It's a wrap with rap. Uh, Instagram, it's a wrap with rap podcast. We're on Twitter or X, which is at rapper, W R A P P E R 130. Our website is it's a wrap with rap.com. And our YouTube channel is it's a wrap with rap, the podcast uncut. I want to thank everyone for listening. Please stay safe. And for now, it's a wrap.